Hey guys, it's Lisa Z from RCP here. Today's very special episode comes to you live from Nashville when the RCP team was there a couple weeks ago at CrimeCon. On this episode, you're going to notice in the very beginning, there's a little bit of a crackly mic going on, but eventually things even out. And I think you're really going to enjoy this panel with Jim, Laura, and I, and our very special guests, Jane Carson Sandler, who tells her very moving story and Mike Morford of the Criminology Podcast. Enjoy. Ready, everybody? Well, look at it. There's people here. There's people here. <laughs> Who's ready to go? All right. Let's make this a great podcast. A notorious cold case finally cracked. Police believe a ruthless serial killer is now behind bars. Known both as the Golden State Killer and the East Area Rapist, investigators say their suspect committed at least 12 murders and more than 50 rapes across California in the 1970s and 80s. We were looking for a needle in a haystack, but we also all knew that the needle was there. Joseph James D'Angelo was arrested Tuesday night in Sacramento, just 10 miles from where the serial attacks began more than 40 years ago. Hello, and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clemente, retired FBI profiler, former New York City prosecutor, and writer-producer on CUS's Criminal Minds. And with me today is... Laura Richards, former New Scotland Yard criminal behavioral analyst and founder of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. And I'm Lisa Zambetti. I'm the casting director for CBS's Criminal Minds, where Jim Clemente is my colleague. I cast psychopaths, victims, FBI agents, and everything in between. And I have a real interest in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. And today we are live from CrimeCon National. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And we have two very special guests with us today. Hi, I am Jane Carson Sandler, victim number five of the East Area Rapist. Thank you for being here. Let's Thank her. you, Jane. And uh, my name is Mike Morford. I co-host a podcast called Criminology. In season two, we are covering the East Area Rapist Golden State Killer case. Well, as, of course, all of our listeners know, we like to look at cases from the victim's perspective. So we're very, very grateful and honored to have you here with us, Jane, and Mike, too, because you also honor the victims of a very prolific offender. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for having us. Okay. So, so why don't we start with Laura? And I just want to give a bit of a backstory because it was actually Morph and I. We met. Was it in an elevator here in was, Indiana, yeah. Indianapolis? Yeah, in, it was uh, last year's Crime Con at Indianapolis. And we bumped into each other and we had a conversation. Unbeknownst to me, you know, six months later, he sent me an email to say that they were covering the East Area Rapist and the Golden State Killer case. And he had asked me, would I be prepared to come on the podcast? And when I started looking at the case, because Mike and Morph, just a show of hands of how many people have been listening to it, I mean, I highly recommend it. You know, I've done a great job of putting together just so many victim stories and statements, and they've been in my ears for the last few months. And I went to London to deliver training on an April the 25th, or just before that, I received an email um, from Morph and from some other individuals saying that they believed they had the perpetrator in custody, which was an incredible feeling. I mean, for me, I can certainly talk about my own experience. I was just so ecstatic I couldn't sleep. And every police officer training session that I ran, I kept talking about this case to blank faces because many of them hadn't heard of this case. Um, and so I know uh, Jane feels strongly about speaking out about uh, not just what happened, but her transitional story of uh, where she is today. But I, for one, am very relieved that this very dangerous perpetrator is in custody. And you know, many of you will know, if you, if you know this case, uh, he is a real sadist um, from calling victims prior to his offense behavior, prior to breaking in, to calling them afterwards too, and just some of the things that he was doing. And I'll ask Mike um, Morph, I'm gonna call him Morph, just to give a little recap of some of the key points off of criminology podcasts, and then we'll hear a little bit from Jane. Okay. 
So the East Area Rapist primarily stalked neighborhoods, and within these neighborhoods, he would choose specific victims, you know, randomly or whoever was available. But he would go into the homes, usually when there was no men at home, or in Jane's case, she was alone with a small child, and he would target them, and he would tie them up, bind them, and eventually sexually assault and, and rape them. And a, a lot of times it was more about the terror that he was instilling as opposed to a sexual act. He was all about the terror. He would call the victims sometimes prior to the attacks and oftentimes after the attacks just to continue that terror. And one victim received the call 24 years later after her attack. <sighs> So that shows you the level of sadistic personality that this guy uh, apparently had. And he certainly did. I mean, I remember listening to you talk about the first, you know, what was seen as the first case. And uh, one of the victims was lying in bed. She was sound asleep, but she woke up to a noise tapping. And when she looked across in her doorway, there was stood a male with a balaclava on who was tapping a knife on the door frame, mm. and he was naked from the waist down. Mm. He was sending a message to her about what was going to happen next. And that's why I knew this wasn't victim number one. This was somebody who had been offending for a period of time, and he was very sadistic and a very dangerous individual. Absolutely. And I know that when we, we looked at this case, when, um, when I first came into the behavioral analysis unit, and we went through dozens, unfortunately dozens of cases in great detail. And what was overwhelmingly clear is that this person not only was a sexual sadist, but that he had some extreme ability to avoid law enforcement. And because of that, we felt that he was most likely a cop. That turned out to be true. So you knew that all the way back then then? Yeah, you sure. Know. and. And when we, when we found out that he had gotten arrested, um, and it turns out he was fired from the police department that he was in after six years because he had shoplifted, I believe it was a hammer and some dog repellent. Um, and maybe you can't understand why somebody would do that but he didn't want an actual record of the transaction because he was being forensically sophisticated. And he didn't want his kill kit or his rape kit to be known and traceable back to him. So that level of sophistication uh, tells us that this guy really knows what he's doing in terms of MO and criminal sophistication. So when he calls the victims behaviorally after all that time, it's just to relive it, to get the rush? Like, is it like... Well, part to relive, but no, to reinstill fear mm -hmm. so that the fear never goes away because he is a sexual sadist. And by definition, they're sexually aroused by causing and witnessing the fear in their victims. Mm -hmm. So that is their point of sexual arousal. Many of them don't even have to engage in sexual acts as long as they can witness this because that gives them an orgasm. And he would spend a lot of time in the houses. You know, he wouldn't just break in, commit the offense. He would actually stay there. He'd open the refrigerator. He'd sometimes eat something at the address. He would keep going back and forth in and out of rooms. He enjoyed being in the room and he certainly wasn't put off if somebody had a child. He certainly wasn't put off if a man was in the house or even if there was a dog. He felt that he could control all of them. So he was sophisticated at the start. He was talking as if he was with someone else. He would just try and distract and make it sound as if it was a different type of offense. And I was just so pleased to hear that he had been caught because someone like him doesn't stop completely. And I just want to make comment on um, a news headline that talked mm -hmm. about his former fiance and blamed her and the headline read that she breaking up with him had fueled his behavior and I want to make it absolutely clear that That's Bonnie absolutely. his fiance had nothing to do with his behavior yeah I mean what was he doing to her 
Why did she leave him? Why did she, quote, break his heart? That's so ridiculous. It's so the opposite side. This man is a sexual sadist. She didn't make him into that. He is a rapist, a serial rapist, and a serial murderer. How could you possibly blame any victim or any person in his life for that? It just, mm. It's just, yeah. it's so it's uncomfortable to have a media. Yeah, you, know, you have to, to cut have that paper. narrative off. Right, right. So I challenged it on Twitter, but it was just incredible how many other people have picked up on it too. And they're the kind of narratives that we have to stamp out because it's his responsibility taking. Um, he was married, of course, and I'm going to be very interested to hear what she has to say. Um, and Morph and I talked about this a little bit because uh, you said that family members were very surprised about him. But I would imagine that coercive control would feature there. Um, sometimes people don't know that they're being controlled or right. that there's abuse, but what neighbors reported was one that there were epic shouting matches. So epic shouting matches, which were no doubt a domestic violence related domestic abuse. And if there's no physical abuse, well, that doesn't mean to say it's not abuse, right? And that's why we opened up with coercive control. And this power and control dynamic, I would expect to see in his everyday life too. So there's a lot more that will no doubt come out of, about him in particular. Um, but we don't want to memorialize him and give him that power and control either. And I want so, to forget his name next week. That's yeah. what, what, what I want yeah. to do. And he is forgettable. What we want to remember is the victims and their families. And that's one of the reasons why, again, we're so happy to have Jane with us today. to get some discarded DNA and we were able to confirm what we thought we already knew that we had our man it is time for the victims to begin to heal I first want to thank every one of you for following this case I had so many people come up to the table today with tears in their eyes and and that caused me to have tears in my eyes because, you know, I know that friend, friends and family have always stuck with us, but to see so many of you that care and, and have been following this and are just so, you're so grateful as we are that this perpetrator is behind bars and that, that just means so much. So I, I just want to thank you. Um, also, about a month ago, um, a girlfriend of mine said, what can I make for your birthday? And I said, oh, just make me a bag. Um, and, you know, East Area Rapist, Golden State Killer on it. And she says, well, you want to say anything else? And I said, yeah, you tell them that uh, we'll see him in court. <laughs> and, and, you know, so not only did she make the bag for me, but she made the shirt. <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. Well, um, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. So if I get a little emotional, please understand. I've told it many times, but for some reason, sometimes it, it, I just uh, tear up. And tonight at uh, 10 o'clock Eastern Time, you'll see the story on 2020 on ABC. So be sure to check in on that. And I did get emotional on that one. Um, it was, oh, thank you for the Kleenex. <laughs> okay, it was um, October 5th, 1976. I was 30 years old. I was married to a, um, an Air Force officer stationed at McClellan Air Force Base. I had a three-year-old son, and I was getting my Bachelor of Degree in Nursing at Cal State University in Sacramento, and I was also in the Air Force Reserves at Travis Air Force Base. So two weeks before the assault, I came home from class one day and I realized that all of my rings that I had purchased or had been given that came from uh, Thailand were missing from my um, jewelry box. And I called my husband and I said, what on earth did you, what did you do with my rings? Did you send them out to be cleaned? And he said, now why would I do something like that? And I thought, you know, that's probably a pretty stupid question. So. 
Anyway, I had been robbed, so the police came, and they, um, sure enough, they did fingerprints and the whole bit, and he had come through my son's bedroom window. Well, at that point, we didn't know anything about the East Area Rapist, Golden State Killer, so I wasn't alarmed, really. Okay, I was robbed, but, uh, and I don't know that he took anything else. So that morning that I was raped, uh, my husband had just left for work. I heard the garage door close. It was about 6.30 in the morning, and my three-year-old son had just gotten in bed with me. And within a few minutes, I saw a flashlight shining down the hall, and, um, and I yelled out to my husband, what did you forget? What's going on? And it wasn't my husband. It was this um, man standing <clears throat> next to me, shining this flashlight in my eyes, wearing a ski mask, black leather gloves, black jacket, high top black sneakers, and holding a large butcher knife, telling me in clenched teeth, shut up, shut up or I'll kill you. And if he said that once, he said it multiple times, shut up, shut up or I'll kill you. So at first I thought, I think he said to me, where's your money or something, I don't know, but I was relieved. I thought, oh, he's just going to rob us and then he's going to be gone. Well, I soon realized that's not what he was there for. He um, immediately uh, tied up um, my son and myself with shoelaces. He gagged us. He blindfolded us. And then he, then he um, took my son and he moved him. I wrote a book, it's called Frozen in Fear. And the reason I named it Frozen in Fear is because that was the major emotion that I was feeling that whole time. I do not remember the rape. Um, I, all I know is that my heart was beating so fast I thought it was going to come through my chest and I kept wondering, what did you do with my son? That was my fear. I had no idea. And people say, well, what would you say to him today if you ever got a chance to you know, talk with him? I'd say, why did you move my son? Where did you move my son? And was it because you wanted more room on the bed when you raped me, or was it because you were just being nice and didn't want him to, you know, be around when he was performing his act? So I really don't remember much about the rape. I was just so emotional, so scared, so terrorized over where's my son. So then he untied my ankles, and then I knew what he was there for. Um, so again, I, I don't remember much about it, except he did have a small penis, and I think everybody knows that now. <laughs> Which yes. is great. Everyone and knows he has a micro yes, penis. And they checked it out yesterday, yes. And I'm very glad that he was tremendously humiliated. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So. And then after that, the fear continued because he took towels and sheets and he started tearing them very methodically. And, and he took a long time doing that. And I thought, okay, now what is he going to do? He's raped me. He's moved, my, he's moved my son. What is he going to do with these sheets and towels that he's tearing? Is he going to hang us? Was he going to bound us up? What's he going to do? Well, thank goodness he didn't do anything. He, he went in my, my um, drawers a couple of times, opened up the dresser drawers, and then he'd go in the kitchen, and I'd heard pots and pans being rattled as though he was cooking something. It was very bizarre. And then he'd come back in the bedroom, and he again would say, don't move or I'll kill you. I'll come back and kill you. So it was um, back and forth, back and forth. I don't know how long he was there, but... Um, after I hadn't heard any noise in the kitchen for maybe 15, 20 minutes, um, and he hadn't been back in the bedroom, you know, telling him he would kill us if he heard anything, I was able to get my blindfold down, and I saw that it was getting light. So I looked over at my son, and praise the Lord, he was asleep. And I think that's God's way of protecting him. So I woke him up, and I said, we've got to get out of here, we've got to get out of here. So we quickly um, jumped out of bed, and I, I know that we didn't really untie ourselves. <laughs> I don't remember that much, but I know we hobbled down the hall and um, tried to go out the front door, but he had taken a chair and propped it up under the door handle. So then we went through the kitchen, and the sliding glass door was opened. 
So we hobbled around <clears throat> to the front of the house, um, opened up the gate, and uh, yelled for a neighbor. A neighbor came, took us to her home, called my husband, and then um, called the police department. Then two men, or three men, male cops showed up, and I really didn't want to talk to them. And then my angel, Carol Daly, who you probably have seen on many shows, uh, she showed up, and thank goodness, because I was able to at least you know, speak with her. She took me to the emergency room, and she sat with me, oh, I know, at least an hour or so. But you know, she had to get back to work. We didn't have cell phones at that time. Um, we didn't have 911 at that time. <laughs> this was back in, this is 42 years ago. So, but she stayed with me, and uh, I'll tell you, I was a hot mess then, just like I am now. He took his knife, and he had um, scraped my chest with the knife. He didn't cut me, but he scraped me, so I had blood coming through my, um, my gown. Yeah. And then, of course, my hair was all, I mean, I was a mess. So I went in to have my exam, and it was a male doctor. Um, and the nurses that were there, um, I think they thought I was losing my mind because one minute I would be laughing and just joyous that I'm alive and my son's alive and thank you, Lord, and then I would sob. So it was like I was bipolar. I mean, it was crazy. But uh, after the exam, which was not very comfortable, I, um, I had to have a shot of penicillin which was very painful in case I would get a venereal disease. And then I had to have the morning after pill in case I would get pregnant. So then I go home. And at that time, um, we didn't have advocates, rape crisis advocates at the time. So I didn't have anybody with me. Uh, I go home, and of course, I hated my home. I, I felt so violated that I, I didn't even want to go in it. And um, my husband put uh, an alarm system on the home the next day. And of course, every day there was Inspector Richard Shelby at the house and Carol Daly at the house with more questions. But uh, one thing that um, has never left me is um, when helicopters fly overhead, it's like a flashback because I hear, um, because every night after the attack, after my attack, the helicopters would hover over the neighborhood with um, lights shining, you know, in the different uh, in the in the neighborhoods, just looking for this perpetrator. Um, and also, it's hard, you know, to see anybody on TV with a ski mask on or ski anymore because that just mm. frightens me. And then, for the longest time, I was always looking at men's shoes to see if they were wearing those black high-top sneakers. So, um, so anyway. <laughs> After that, I waited. I waited too long. I probably waited five months before I went to the rape crisis center in Sacramento. I should have gone right away. But I thought, hey, I'm a nurse. I'm in the military. I can handle this. I'm strong. Well, I found out that I wasn't strong. So once I went to um, the um, rape crisis center, I met other women that had been raped and I realized that my emotions were very similar to theirs and I wasn't going crazy. Then I was able, I was writing a pamphlet for um, a school assignment at Cal State, so I was able to go out and interview other women that had been raped. So that was healing for me, very healing. Then we moved, well then my husband and I were actually we, we separated, but we did get back together, and we moved to another base. And I just kind of put this whole situation on back burner because I had my career. I had my nursing career, my military career. I was a mother. You know, I was a wife. So I really, um, you know, for many years, it was just there on the back burner, and I wasn't really affected by it. But uh, then I, um, I read the book by um, oh, uh, Purpose Driven Life. I'm trying to think of his name. Um, Rick Warren, yes. And I thought, you know, that, that assault, I'm not going to let that define me or defeat me in any way. And um, I'm going to use this experience in a positive way. I'm going to make my mess a message 
I'm going to turn my pain into power. And I'm going to go from being a victim to a survivor to a thriver. So I started um, doing public speaking to women's groups, church groups, and then I went into prisons and I would speak to rapists. Oh. And this was really awesome because I, you will not believe how they responded. I would say to them, okay, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to pretend that I'm your, your mother, your lover, your sister, your best friend. And then I tell my story because I would want to sensitize them to the effects of, you know, what they had, they had done to their victims. And, you know, when I was done, they were so mad. They like, I'd kill that son of a bitch if he ever did that to my sister or my mother or my lover. And I say, well, that would get you right back where you are today. But they never realized, that, you know, what the effect of their behavior had. So um, I, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy, I enjoy going to prisons. But, uh, and then I wrote my book, Frozen in Fear, and that was really healing for me. I, I'm sold out right now, but you can get it online on Amazon. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> and, and that took me a year, actually a year to write. And my husband, who's here, he was so great. He'd always cook the meals, and he was so patient with me over that time because it wasn't, an, it wasn't easy because I was reliving everything again. So then... Um, two years ago this summer, in June, I was in Maine, and I received a letter from the Sacramento Police Department telling me that uh, there was going to be a $50,000 reward put out by the FBI for the um, identification of the Golden State Killer, of the East Area Rapist Golden State Killer. And, uh, and probably would there, there would be media coverage following that announcement. So I thought, well, it's about time. And I didn't realize why it was that, you know, two years ago. And I believe it was because that was the date of the first time and he had ever attacked anyone. When, I guess it was maybe seven years ago, my husband and I were down in Southern California and we actually, uh, we were at a conference and um, Michelle McNamara was in touch with me and wanted to know if she could interview me. Um, and I did have the privilege of spending some time with her. She was a lovely lady, and she God was. bless her. She worked so hard on, on trying to have this man identified, and I'm just so sorry she's not here today, but yeah. she's watching down yeah. to us from heaven. And, but, but she uh, had named him the Golden State Killer, and I wasn't happy about that because he was known as the East Area Rapist, and how dare she change his name to the Golden State Killer. But, you know, it's a good thing because he just didn't rape. And he, he didn't just commit his crimes in, in Northern California. He went to Southern California, so he deserves to be called, you know, the Golden State Killer. So anyway, in the last two years, uh, it's really been a roller coaster of many interviews, um, public speaking, and... All it, it's so important for me, though, to get the message across that um, for anyone that's been assaulted, it's so important to share that with someone. Don't keep it a secret because you remain a prisoner if you keep that a secret and your assailant runs free. If it's a best friend, if it's a therapist, I don't care, but, you know, get rid of your shame. I carried that backpack of anger and shame and revenge and regret and you name it. I carried it for a long, long time. And when I was finally able to forgive this guy, and I had to, I had to forgive him. That doesn't mean I don't want to punch him in the nose today, I do. But, but I had to because it was just weighing me down and I had absolutely no room in my heart for love. I was just constantly just bogged down by, you know, by what he had done and how I wanted to get back out of him. So um, the last two years have really, again, been healing for me. And I, I just want to encourage everyone to share your story. Share it. Help. Because by sharing it then, um, you'll help someone else. And then they'll reach out and, and help another. And that's what it's all about. And then you need to get your, your, your story validated. And, and don't keep it a secret. And we all need to be validated. We need to be heard. Mm -hmm. We need to be said, yeah, Susan or Jane or Mary, I hear you. Or Bob or Tom mm -hmm. or Billy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's true, too. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and thank you for bringing that up, because I think men need to um, 
also maybe get some therapy after their love their loved one is assaulted because what do they know about how do you handle a victim how do you handle a wife that's been that's been raped there's no experience there and they have so much inside of them of anger you can imagine i think my husband would have killed this guy if he had caught him you know right after but uh they they need um they need support and they need help too and uh and get rid of that, that shame that, oh my God, my wife was raped. Back in the 70s, back in 76, we didn't talk about it. I mean, being raped was a, you, you know, you just didn't talk about it. I remember going to an officer's wife's club um, function and all the women there were talking about the East Area Rapist and how he was cutting off women's nipples and oh, they went on and on. And I just sat there in shock and I went, you have no idea. But you know, I could not tell them that I was a victim because I was so ashamed. Mm. I felt guilt, you know, did I cause it? What was I wearing? All those feelings. And rape is about, rape is not about sex. Rape is about power mm -hmm. and rape is about control. And that is what this monster was about. Power and control. So I'm just, I'm just so grateful to be here and uh, just, Thank you so much for following this case and supporting us. I, you know, my um, event is nothing compared to what uh, my friend Debbie Domingo, whose mother was brutally murdered, and, and my friend Michelle, whose sister was bludgeoned beyond recognition and raped. And they're with me at my booth. And, and then Margaret, she's not up here now, but she was 13 when he raped her. It's hard to get your head around, folks, but uh, thank God he's behind bars. So thank you. Thank you. This morning, new details of the rigorous investigation that detectives say brought down the Golden State Killer more than 40 years after his alleged killing spree began. Law enforcement sources telling ABC News they used a genealogy website to help connect Joseph D'Angelo's DNA to past crime scenes, taking that evidence and then comparing it with family members within the online database until they found their suspect. I just want to say thank you to Jane. I know all of you um, were with her through that journey, but it's not easy sitting up here, and it's certainly even harder talking about your own experience, but you have helped so many people, Jane, by doing that, certainly in this room and also in other forums when you talk to other people who have been victimized and keep that secret. Um, I think it's you know so powerful. And just to your point about power and control, because rape, as we all know, it's not about the sexual gratification. It is about that power and control. And I just want to give uh, an aspect to that in this case, in that at a community meeting that was held, um, a man stood up, and it was after the first time he had broken into a house with the husband there. And the man in the audience stood up and challenged the police and said, I just don't believe you that he broke in and there was a man in the house and he still raped the wife in front of him. I just can't believe that happened. And the police put him straight and said, that's exactly what happened. Now, three weeks later, that man who stood up, his house was broken into by the same individual, and he raped his wife in front of him. Now, that is about power and control. That's about someone saying, I am the all-powerful. And I would be surprised, it would be the 1% of cases that that power and control isn't seen in his everyday life. And there will be aspects and elements of it um, to the point that Dennis Rader, you know, who gave himself the moniker Bind, Torture, Kill, mm -hmm. well, he used to measure the blades of grass. Mm -hmm. So when his partner said he was never, there was never any domestic violence, well, she may well have been talking about physical abuse, but mm -hmm. somebody who measures blades of grass, mm -hmm. you know, again, people talking about his behavior and the power and control. So I think it's really important that people do frame it in the way that we understand it and you know, talk to the partners and ex-partners because these individuals, these perpetrators do have relationships and they do get married. And the quality of those relationships are what we talk about on the podcast and, and in my everyday work, coercive control. Absolutely, and I wanna add that 
you know, Jane, I was victimized when I was a kid, and I, at the time, I worked the investigation with the FBI, and um, I would eventually be recruited and become an FBI agent as a result of that investigation. But when we actually locked the guy up, I was so worried that it was going to hit the news. I was so worried that the people that I worked with would find out that I was the victim of a sex crime. And it was a, it was a very, very difficult time in my life. Um, since then, though, um, after I did get into the FBI, I actually was put on the squad that had just finished investigating my case. And instead of feeling like I had to hide it, I was working with people who helped me lock the guy up. And so it totally turned everything on its head, and the shame was gone. And you talk about forgiveness, which is a very difficult thing for a lot of victims of crime, and I applaud you for getting to that space. And I didn't get to that space until I was speaking almost 10 years later in Toronto, and I was speaking with, um, uh, I think his name is uh, Sheldon Kennedy. He was a hockey player that was also victimized as a kid. And somebody stood up in the audience and said, have you forgiven the guy? And I was like, well, I've never even considered that. Why would I forgive him? I mean, he never asked me. And then I said, you know what? I forgive him. And it was like the first time in 20 years the weight was lifted off my shoulder because that anger, mm -hmm. that hatred, mm -hmm. that I need to get him back mm -hmm. was still there even though he had been locked up. And so I do applaud you for getting there. I'm happy I got there. Yes. And it's something that you have to do at your own pace. Yeah, you, can't you don't have force to get it. there. No, you don't yeah, have because, to get there. No. But yeah. you may find that it helps. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in my case, I, I don't care to forgive, but you can forget and you can move on and so it doesn't control you. So I'd like to mention that too, that um, forgiveness is such a personal thing and it's, it's not a microwave event. I mean, it takes, it takes a long time and it takes a lot of prayer in order to do something like that. But uh, I had, I finally, you know, that's not for everyone. And I'm not saying you have to do it, you don't. Um, it's just definitely a, a personal thing, but um, it just took a lot of time and a lot of prayer for me to get to that point. But as Jim said, it's, it's very freeing. And you talked about Jay and your husband and his support. Now he's also in the room as well. And can we pay tribute to him? You may. His... Well, this isn't the same guy that was with me when I was raped. No, no. Okay. okay. This is the guy I just celebrated my 24th wedding anniversary with. Well, congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Hang up, Roger. There he is. He's my rock. Morph, do you want to just tell us where you are with your podcast as well? Because you were the first podcast to break news, were you not, that he had been arrested? And just tell us where you are in the season. Yeah, so... You know, when, it, when I got the news, I got a text from somebody that said, are our boys in custody? And I, I didn't necessarily believe it. And I checked with another source, and they replied and said, yes, but don't say anything. So for two hours, I'm sitting there like, oh, I got to tell somebody. I got to tell somebody. <laughs> and I was like, I can't wait to share this news. And then I got a thumbs up to share it, and I did. And it was surreal. Um, but we were planning 12 episodes of our podcast on the case and we got to around episode 10 and that's where the murders start in Southern California and then this came and you know as bad as things were for the rape victims in Northern California he sunk to an all new mm -hmm. level of depravity in Southern California you know Jane mentioned a little bit Debbie's mother um, being killed murdered and, and her boyfriend and uh, Michelle's sister and being bludgeoned and just awful, terrible crimes that he committed down there during, during these uh, sexual attacks. And I know for a fact you didn't sleep for about 48 hours because I was in the same state but watching what you were putting out on Twitter and you know it's just so great when you get good news yeah. um, and you know certainly uh, so many victims i just you know in terms of when you listen to the your podcast in particular with with mike you hear so much about the script that this particular individual kept to and then obviously escalated his behavior 
um, but the detail that you went into, and they put the victim's voice at the centre of it, which, you know, we're now hearing more and more, aren't we? And, you know, I think the Real Crime Profile and, and the work that's, uh, you know, being done by Jim and, and myself and others, it really is, you know, Jane standing up, it really is making a difference. We really are changing the narrative, and that's an important point. I just want to, you know, acknowledge you and Mike uh, for, for doing such a great podcast. And I think you've got, have you got two more that are about to drop? Or We've where got two more coming up, but there's so many developments in here, we're probably going to keep going until we get all the answers. But right. we, were, we were very fortunate enough to have people like Jane and Michelle and uh, other victims that have come forward, survivors, and some great investigators, Paul Holes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, give a shout out. Just some Holmes. really great people that have decided to come on and help spread the word even you know Richard Shelby and and Carol Daly and people that retired decades ago that yeah. still care about this case to help keep it going and get the word out there and it was just it's been a, a, a really great experience with everybody Thank you. all right well unfortunately we have to go but we are literally out of time and we really appreciate you coming and listening to real crime profile but also for honoring Jane for the hero yeah. For the heroes. Thank you for listening to Real Crime Profile. If you like our podcast, there are a few things you can do. You can take two minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave a five star review. You can also check out all Real Crime Profile offers and promotions and our sponsors in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go to Facebook and like our Facebook page, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Real Crime Profile without the E. And one last thing, please tell your friends, family and colleagues about us and spread the Real Crime Profile word. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate all of our listeners. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineering by Mike Thal. Music is composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107. Or you can go to the website where there's a lot of information and advice that you can follow on www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Helpline for free on 0800 2000 247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, shelter or counselling, you can call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, on 214 946 4357. You can also go to their website for further advice or support, www.genesisshelter.org. And there's the Domestic Violence Hotline on 800-799-7233.